three quick reads. Upstairs? Go roll. I don't care what they say upstairs. You cannot film the time. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. March 31st, 2019, at about 3.20 in the afternoon, there was an explosion of violence at the intersection of Slauson and Crenshaw. Snitch. 
but no gang member wants to be considered a snitch. It is highly offensive to any gang member to, to even, it even be suggested that he is a snitch. There was a conversation that afternoon between the two men about that subject, and we'll hear more about that from witnesses during the trial. So going back to Sunday, March 31st, 2019, in South Los Angeles at uh, Strip Mall, right at the intersection of South Los Angeles, 3420 Slauson Street. Uh, there's some businesses there that you can see on this exhibit. Now, this location was home to Nipsey Hustle, and I'll, I'll alternate between calling him Mr. Askadon and Nipsey Hustle. So that we're all clear we're talking about the same person. And uh, I'll try to stick with Mr. Askadon as much as I can, but I, I find myself saying this to Hustle sometimes, so I don't need any disrespect in doing that. Mr. Askadon uh, was very familiar to this location. He grew up in this neighborhood and spent a lot of time in this strip mall, and he engaged in some questionable activities in this, in this strip mall. He had the police called on him a number of times for doing things in the area of this strip mall. But at some point in life, he got successful enough that he bought the whole property. He owned it. And he owned most of the businesses that operated there. And the ones he didn't own, he leased to others. When I talked about the arc of Mr. Askadon's life, it started in the role of 60s. And it started with him being engaged in criminal street gang activities. But as he got older and found music and it consumed him, his life changed. And part of that change was reflected in some of his newfound wealth and investments. You're going to see a number of uh, video clips during the trial. And we'll identify those clips to you uh, in a way that you can keep track of which camera you're looking at each time. But what you're looking at now is going to be one of the main perspectives you see from these videos. This is going to be called camera six. You're looking at a camera affixed to a shell gas station pointed directly into that strip mall parking lot. And it's not showing up. At the far end of the picture in the top corner is the marathon clothing store. One of the businesses owned by Nipsey Hussle. And this is a place that he frequented. Whenever he was in town, when he wasn't out on tour, he would stop by this strip mall. He would make phone calls from his car. He'd text people. He'd go check on his businesses. He'd hang out in the parking lot. He'd greet people, take photographs, and that sort of thing. On this particular Sunday, Mr. Askadon arrived at about 2.50 p.m. <clears throat> and if you look at the top, you see a car pulling, not that car in the middle of the photo, but you see a vehicle at the very top kind of parking along in front of the building, in front of the businesses there. That's Mr. Askadon. He arrived at 2.50 p.m. unannounced, no security, no fanfare. This was his home. Nipsey Hussle believed <coughs> every place was his home. He believed that uh, he could go to any neighborhood and he'd be welcome. That he had transcended the petty squabbles of gangs. That even some rival gangs would say, oh, that's Nip. He's cool. So certainly he felt very comfortable in his own neighborhood and on his own property. He showed up about 2.50 p.m. that day. And this is his vehicle parked where he parked it. 
and he sat in his car for a few minutes before he emerged. And when he emerged, he did what he typically does.
uh, Mr. Holder said, oh, turn in here. There's a place in here where I want to get some food. So she turned into what was a very busy parking lot, as you can see. And this is her white car turning into the lot at the top right of the image. And as she turned into the lot, she drove right past a group of men you can see standing there. And I can tell you, in that group, you see, to the far right, Herman Douglas, also known as Cowboy. You also can fairly make out uh, Mr. Askadon by the white uh, wave cap, or do rag, if you will, that he's wearing. And next to him on his right is a man named Evan McKenzie, also known as Rembo. And they're all friends, and they're all from the neighborhood, just chatting. As Ms. Nicholson drives in, Nipsey looks at the car and says, is that shitty? He was referring to Mr. Holt, who is also known as Shitty Cuz. It's an alias, it's a nickname. As he's saying that, Ms. Nicholson, who's driving in, is saying, oh my God. That's Nipsey Hussle. She had no idea that she was going to see him on that day. She's a fan. And she even said something to the effect of, oh my God, Nipsey is so fine. Eric Holder, sitting right next to her, said nothing. He didn't say, oh, I know him. Or we grew up together. No, no response at all. She had no idea that Eric Holder knew who Nipsey Hussle was. So she pulls into the lot, and at first with no place to park, she stops her car at what, as we look at it, uh, will be near that fence. Uh, whose name I don't know. But 
he gets an autograph and he walks off. Now, Brianita is sitting in her car. She's turned it around. Still no place to park. She's sitting in the car and she sees Eric Holder walk over to Nipsey Hustle. And in her mind, she thinks, oh, he's going to try to get a picture before me. So what does she do? She jumps out of the car and she runs over to get a, a photograph with Nipsey Hussle. She walks right up to the group and she notes that there's a conversation going on. And she doesn't know how it started. She's not even sure what was being said, but she heard Mr. Holder using the word snitch for Mr. Askedon, saying something to the effect of, did you snitch or did you ever snitch? Something like that. She's really unclear on what was being said or what context it was in, but she hears the word snitch. And when asked what were the demeanors of both Mr. Askedon and Mr. Holder, she said, well, as she put it, Nipsey seemed cool. He seemed very casual, but Mr. Holder seemed a little, what she described as messy, a little agitated maybe, a little bit on edge. <clears throat> Cowboy is also there listening to this conversation. And Cowboy is a self-described former Rolling 16th gang member. Now he's kind of an older cat. And he's there, and he also says, well, there was a conversation between Eric Holder and Nipsey Hussle. And in that conversation, Nipsey was telling Mr. Holder that there's word on the street about you snitching. And you need to clear that up. You need to go get the paperwork, which gang members often use to refer to court documents and such. You need to go get the paperwork to show that, that this didn't happen. And he said it was a cool conversation. <clears throat> there was no hostility. There, were no, there was no pushing or shoving or anything like that because as he put it, if he even had an inkling that Nipsey was in any kind of danger, he would have been on it. And one of the things you're going to learn during this trial is that after a life in a game, you become very sensitive to those kinds of things. If you live with your head on a swoop, you're constantly looking for danger. You have to to survive. So these guys do get pretty good at recognizing, and maybe even sometimes over-recognizing or over-interpreting situations that, that are actually dangerous, but they see potential <coughs> But he said he didn't see anything like that at all. It seemed like a regular conversation. But obviously it wasn't. Those are the individuals in the group. And after the, during the conversation, Brian Nita Nicholson said, Nipsey stopped and asked if she wanted a picture. And she was just standing there. She said, yes, so what does he do? She walks over, he takes a picture with a fan. That's the picture that he took, one of the last photographs ever taken of Nipsey Hussle. And you can see how happy she is. Because you can imagine that she get her social media and post that picture and say, look who I was with. And that is Meanwhile, Mr. Holder was still there talking to the group. After a few minutes, he walks away, he goes back to the map.
He walked over to the car. He walks over, he 
kicks him in the head, and then he runs back toward the alley. I'm going to show you two video clips of the shooting. The first one will be from this perspective, at regular speed. The second one will be cropped in a little closer and at a little bit slower speed. Mr. Holder flees the location, he runs right back past that master burger restaurant that has pretty good cameras. And when he does that, he gets picked up by a camera that shows him running by where you can clearly see the revolver in one hand. And if you look very closely, you can see part of the semi-automatic in the other hand. He 
runs to Miss Nicholson. Now, Miss Nicholson has been sitting in the car when she hears a couple of gunshots. And then she sees some guy running. Obviously, she gets concerned. She doesn't know what's going on. She's wondering where Eric is. She's worried about him. And, but she almost takes off because it looks like pandemonium is breaking loose. When he runs up to the car and he jumps inside the car, and when he gets in the car, she sees two guns. And she starts saying, asking questions, what happened? What happened? Did, are you okay? Are you hurt? And he just says, drive, drive. And she's hesitating because she wants to know what happens. And eventually he says, drive before I slap you. And he had never threatened her before. He had never raised his voice at her before. She was afraid, so she drove off, heading back home, but still asking questions. What happened back there? Did you hear the gunshots? You know, who was shooting? He didn't answer any questions. He just sat silent. So Ms. Ms. Nicholson was asked, well, what, well, what did you think happened? And she says, well, I don't know what happened. I thought maybe somebody was shooting or maybe somebody was shooting at him. <clears throat> but when asked, did it occur to you that maybe he did the shooting? She said, no, why would he shoot me? I was like, I never knew him to be that kind of person. I wouldn't think he would do that. When Ms. Nicholson testified, pay attention to her. Pay attention to how she processes the questions, even basic questions. I think you will find in her a certain naivete, a certain simplicity. And I'm not going to want to be disparaging. Um, but she's really a very kind of, I would say, unsophisticated person. I think you'll find it from the other. Anyway, she starts driving down to Long Beach and it's a long, quiet ride. She gets to Long Beach, she drops him off at a cousin's house, and then she goes home. Later that night, she gets a phone call from Mr. Holder and he asks if he can spend the night at her place. Well, she just got her place. She has no furniture in her place. And uh, she said, well, why, why do you need to spend the night at my place? He said, well, you know what my place looks like. And apparently his place was, was pretty bad. He was living with an uncle. And it was kind of atrocious, right? unclean. And so he said to her, well, I don't want to go there because the place is it's just nasty. And because she had been there, <coughs> she thought, oh, yeah, well, I'll let you stay. You can stay with me and my mom. She took him to her mom's house. They spent the night. The next day, he asked her if he could get, uh, could she help, could she help him get a room? Because he had no ID. And in order to rent a room, you need ID. So she did. She went to a motel. She helped him get a room, used her ID, and then she went off to work. Now that night, she had heard, because people were, responding to her Facebook and saying, when did you take that picture? Did you hear what happened to Nipsey Hussle? So she heard that night after the shooting that Nipsey Hussle had been shot. But in her mind, she did not put that shooting together with the shooting that she was there for. Nor did she think at that point that Mr. Holder had anything to do with it. That was Monday. Monday night, by Tuesday, she had heard enough about the shooting that she started to have real questions. And maybe, maybe he did, maybe he did this shooting. And then her mother called and said, why is your car on the news? Because LAPD got the video, saw what the car looked like, and started broadcasting that this is a wanted vehicle. Her mother saw it and told her, we got to go to the police. 
on Wednesday, they went to the police. And they met with Detective Washington and Detective Amaral. And she walked up to the front desk. Well, before they met with the detective, she walks up to the front desk and said, my car was on the news. I'm supposed to come in. And she was sent away. Apparently, the guy at the front desk didn't recognize the import of why she was there. So she left. The detective got a hold of her. She came back. And then she submitted to about a four or five hour interview with detectives. And before she was interviewed, they read her her rights. They said, you have the right to remain silent. You have the right to the presence of an attorney if you want. You have all these rights before we talk to you. What do you want to do? And she said, I want to talk to you. So they interviewed her for quite some time about what she knew about the shooting. She answered all of their questions. Um, they asked her if she minded if they looked at her phone. In fact, they asked if they could search her phone, which means extract all the data from her phone. She consented to it. They asked if they could search her car. She said it's parked outside. They secured the car. They searched the car. They asked if they could search her home. She agreed. They asked if they could search her mother's home. She agreed. So obviously, they're doing their due diligence because there is a woman who drove the shooter to the place where the shooting happened in a way. And to ensure that she was not involved, that this wasn't somehow something that was planned or that she played any role in, they looked very closely into her life. And she consented to it, which is, I think, something you should give a lot of value and weight to. She consented to it all. After that interview, and the case was presented to the district attorney's office, I wanted to talk to her. So again, she was asked to voluntarily speak to me. I interviewed her for about two hours. And again, she was informed of her rights, she waived her rights. She sat there by herself with two detectives flanking her and a district attorney, and she answered all of our questions. You will hear that she has been 100% cooperative with the investigation and with the case. She testified in front of the grand jury. She did so knowing that there were many, many threats published on social media by gang members and non-gang members who wanted to know who the driver was because of the, the social media sphere thought that the driver was involved in the killing. So even in light of all of that, she's been very cooperative she will walk into this courtroom and answer all the questions that are put to her here once again. Now you saw from the video that it was more than the Nipsey Hussle who was injured in the shooting. Obviously he was killed. But this man, Kerry Lathan, who was 56 years old at the time, he just got out of prison, by the way. Kerry Lathan suffered a conviction for murder He's, in 1996, I believe it was, he spent 25 years in prison. He got out in September 2018. When he got out of prison, he's from the neighborhood. He's rolling 60s, old G. When he got out of prison, Nipsey Hussle had heard about him and sent him a care package of clothing from his clothing store. Had never met him before, but just wanted him to land on his feet, so he sent over a bunch of clothing. And based on that, Gary Lathan uh, met him a couple of times after that to thank him. And on this particular Sunday, went over to the store to buy something. And when he pulled up and got out of the vehicle, he saw uh, Nipsey sitting there. And so he just walked over and started talking to him. 
and they sit there and talk in the parking lot. And you're going to get the whole video clip from the time Nipsey Hussle arrives to shoot. So you can go through it and see the whole timeline. I'm showing you clips this morning, but you'll get the whole thing. And you'll see that he wasn't there more than a few minutes before Holder came back and did the shooting. And he suffered uh, a, a very serious injury. He was shot in the back. The bullet lodged in the, in the place that made it very difficult for him. We saw him on the ground. He couldn't move. Um, he now is, is sort of limited. He's confined to a convalescent home. He's confined to a wheelchair. Uh, the shooting has impacted his life severely. And uh, he's going to come to court, but he may not be very cooperative when he comes to court. And, and that might be true of some of the other witnesses, too. Because of the nature of this case, the fact that it is a rolling 60s case, I'll call it. You have two rolling 60s gang members involved in a neighborhood where you're not supposed to talk to the police, even if you're the victim of a crime. You know, you know uh, we'll see um, how willing he is to answer <coughs> questions when he comes in. But he has answered questions in the past. He was interviewed. I interviewed him. He testified at the grand jury. So hopefully when we bring him to court, he will testify here in front of you as well. And if he doesn't, there's some tools in the law that allow us to try to deal with that and get the information that he knows out to you. The main thing about him, though, is he got hurt really, really badly. He wasn't there when this conversation was going on between Mr. Asked and Mr. Holder. He came at the tail end of it. But he was there when the shooting happened. And what Mr. Lathan is able to tell you is that he's just sitting there leaning back against the car when he hears you're through and he looks over and sees his muzzle flash. So in a very tight, confined space, he tries to get out of there and do his job. Shermai Villanueva is Mr. Lathan's nephew. He's the one who brought Mr. Lathan there that day. And he's another one who I expect to come to court to try and get him to testify is going to be a challenge. Um, he's on the body worn video that he saw. He got shot in the lower abdomen, but fortunately for him, the bullet hit his belt buckle and fragmented. So he has superficial injuries. Um, you'll see a photograph and some video of his bloody shirt. And he was very fortunate. When you watch the video, if you can imagine the two parked cars with Mr. Layton here and Nipsey Hussle here facing each other. Mr. Villanueva was at the other end of that alley. So when Holder walks up and starts shooting, he's directly in the line of fire. body-worn camera, that's Mr. Villain, that's Terry Lathan is on the ground behind the white alley, and uh, Villain the way was in the pink shirt. Cowboy is the one with the cowboy hat, leaning, trying to render first aid, and Evan McKenzie of Renfall is the one standing up looking down. That's Villain the way was. some of the blood on his shirt from, again, what was a superficial injury. Uh, Mr. Lathan uh, was taken to the hospital. We'll hear from him about his injuries. Mr. Villanueva declined any kind of treatment. And uh, obviously, uh, Mr. Askadam was taken to the hospital and pronounced after 
shooting like this, detectives will fan out and try and collect anything they think might be relevant. So that's how we got the video. They go around, they canvas businesses to look for video, and we got a number of uh, video clips based on that effort. The other important thing that we found were these cases. Now, if you've ever fired a gun before, and I know some of you have, you know that semi-automatic handguns automatically spit out part of the cartridge. The cartridge is an unfired bullet. We're going to bring an expert in it to tell you how semi-automatic handguns work and what these things are you see in this picture. This is part of what we typically call a bullet, technically it's a cartridge. And this is the part that houses the gunpowder in the projectile. The projectile is the part that leads the gun to hit things. This part that houses all of that gets ejected from the gun every time the trigger is pulled, the new cartridge is loaded, when that's fired, this gets kicked out, and as many times as you pull the trigger, these cases will get kicked out. Investigators found eight of these at the crime scene. They are 40 caliber cartridges, cartridge cases. They were examined and determined to all, all to have been fired through the same handgun. You're going to learn a little bit about how uh, scientists are able to make that determination. So we have eight different cases, all the same caliber, examined under high-powered microscopes, and determined to all have been fired from the same gun. So what this evidence is going to show you is that Mr. Holder fired at least eight rounds from the semi-automatic. I say at least eight because there were a lot of people out there that day. Things could have gotten kicked around. Uh, these things are small. Oftentimes they're found. Sometimes they're missed. But we had at least eight. So that tells you eight shots from the city on that. What you'll learn is that a revolver doesn't automatically kick out the cases. They stay in the gun. So. Revolver, typically five rounds. Five or six. Five or six rounds. And there's no way of telling how many were in the gun that day, but if there are eight casings from the semi automatic, and you'll hear that Mr. Askadon was shot at least 10 separate times, maybe 11. Lathan was shot, and Villanueva was shot. Um, if you assume 11 shots, that's 13 shots in total, at least. If you assume 10 shots, that's 12 shots in total. So eight from one gun and the balance from the other. Uh, this exhibit just shows you where the cameras were positioned. We'll, we'll get into this more when these witnesses, the witnesses who collected this video testified. There's another camera that showed um, Ms. Nicholson's car leaving the alley. And then the autopsy. I'm not going to show you any autopsy photos today. But I do want to say a, a few things about Mr. Askadon's injuries. They were devastating injuries. He was shot in the head. The, the shot to the head did not penetrate the skull. It went through the scalp and back out. Amazing. Um, but he was shot from literally from, from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. He suffered um, perforated lung, three different bullets uh, perforated his lungs. One bullet transfected his spine, so even if he had survived, he would have been paraplegic. He was shot, one bullet shot and passed through his lip. So, um, it was, it was a, a 
devastating attack on him. And I think you will find by that kick to the head at the end that it was a very personal attack. You will see the photographs when the coroner comes. Um, they're not going to be especially graphic, I can tell you, because the coroner will have cleaned up the injuries and will basically be looking at holes in the body. So if you're sensitive to that, I don't want you to think that you're going to see anything overly graphic when that time comes. Yeah. So let's go back to Mr. Holder. He got a room on Monday. On Tuesday, Tuesday we got arrested. Not have counsel ask these questions. This is open, Mr. Kevin. Proceed. The shooting happened on Sunday. We stayed with the Friday night and Sunday night. He got a room on Monday. He stayed in that room on Monday night. I believe he was arrested on Tuesday. Okay? That's how I knew it. And he was picked up by a deputy sheriff in Bellflower. And when he was picked up, he was, it's okay. When he was picked up, he was wearing the same clothes that he's wearing at the time of the shooting. Right down to the bandana. Same sneakers, same belt, same pants, same red shirt. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, the evidence in this case will clearly show, leave you absolutely no doubt, that Mr. Holder killed Hermes Askadon and injured Gary Linton and Sherman Williams. There'd be no doubt about that. You're going to hear and see evidence that he had plenty of opportunity to think about what he was going to do before he did it and did it. And I make that point because we have charged not just murder, but premeditated and deliberate murder. The difference between premeditated and deliberate murder and murder will be argued during at the end of the case. Premeditation and deliberation doesn't mean long-term planning. It just means you had an opportunity to think about what you were going to do before you did. And from the time you got out of the car, to walk all the way back to that skirt mall and walk up to those gentlemen and, and start shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting. Clearly, you had plenty of time for premeditation and deliberation. We also charged two counts of attempted murder and two counts of assault with a firearm for the shootings of Dylan Weba and Lincoln. So we charged that conduct in two different ways. And I can't argue the difference to you now or explain to you now why that's done, but at the end of the case I will. I will explain to you and argue to you that what he did was in fact both attempted murder and the lesser crime of assault with a firearm. A lot of this case is going to be video, uh, but there will be witnesses. I will try to introduce witnesses in a logical sequence, but just like a lot of jurors have issues and dates and appointments, it's not going to be presented perfectly logically. And uh, to the extent that this is a case from South LA in a neighborhood claimed by a gang, some witnesses may appear and not seem all that helpful or cooperative in answering questions by either side. So be, be prepared for that. And with that said, I thank you for your time and your attention this morning. Everything that you saw is going to be represented when a witness testifies. And you will get it at the end of the case to have during your deliberations. Thank you. Thank you.